The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. Jesus said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. The Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. We are living in difficult times. We are living in a strange moment. The world seems to be turned upside down. And whenever there's things that are upside down, whenever there are strange moments, whenever it's difficult, we begin to question. We question God, but we also question those who are in authority. We we question their leadership. In fact, we are doing that all the time. At Grandview right now, Kent Henning's retiring this year. And so we're beginning to think about leadership and what the next president will be like. Or this week in California, they're voting on whether to recall the governor or not. That doesn't happen a lot. Or depending on your political affiliation, you have strong opinions about the leadership of the President of the United States. All of us are asking these questions. All of us are wondering, what is good leadership? What does it look like? But have you ever wondered What would happen if we put Jesus to the same scrutiny as we do our leaders? What would it be like, what kind of leader would Jesus be? What kind of president or CEO would Jesus make? Have you ever wondered that question? I mean, imagine as a CEO his corporate policies, like, hey, when someone offends you, turn the other cheek. HR would have a nightmare with that. Or, Don't store up treasure on earth. Sell all that you have and give it to the poor. I guess the shareholders would not be happy with that position. Or his teachings. His teachings aren't that efficient. They don't lead to success. I mean, Jesus' best story is about a young man who wastes all his money and comes back, and his dad doesn't give him a lecture, but instead says, hey, let's have a party. My dad would not throw a party like that. He'd say, what did you do with the money? Or even more than that, who would run a business like that vineyard owner who said, whether you work a full day or part of a day, or if you show up the last second, we'll pay for you. Would any of your companies ever do that for you? No way. Or think of that book, Good to Great by Jim Collins. One of, on that book on leadership, He says, to have the best kind of company, the best kind of business, you have to get the right people on the bus, and then you have to get the wrong people off the bus. And that kind of works with business. But that's not how Jesus works. With Jesus, he puts everyone on the bus, even those who are betraying him, and he doesn't kick them off. And so Jesus isn't quite the leader. He's not a very good leader by our standards. And I share this with you because today in our reading, Jesus tells his disciples about the kind of leader that he is. And then he goes further and tells his followers the kind of followers he wants them to be. Listen again to our gospel reading, verse 27 and following. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others, one of the prophets. But Jesus asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, you're the Messiah. And Jesus sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. 
Now, you have to get the context of what's happening here. Jesus is in Caesarea Philippi. Now, I want you to file that name in your, in your head for a second, Caesarea. Just put that in your head for just a minute. We're going to get back to that. But Caesarea Philippi is in the very north of Israel. And Jesus' ministry has been up in the north, and he's about ready to turn south. And he's going to go and die. And so before he travels down, kind of like a good leader, he, he wants to gather his, his team together. He wants to say, okay, things are going to change. Let's, let's get together and let's focus. And so he asks him a question, like, who do people say that I am? And that's easy. Oh, people are saying, Jesus, that you're like John the Baptist, or you're Elijah, you're one of the prophets. You are doing some really good stuff, Jesus. The polls are out. You are surging in the polls. You have the approval of everyone. But then Jesus goes further and he says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, who always speaks up first, does it again, raises his hand, Jesus, call on me. He says, you're the Messiah. Peter gets it. Except there's a problem. When he says you're the Messiah, he's thinking of King David. He's thinking of that great warrior. He's thinking about the champion who will gather a military and kick out the oppressor. He's thinking about the one who's going to purify everyone so that they really live right. And remember, what city is he in? I told you to follow the way. What city is this? Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea. Who's that named after? Caesar. Okay, so it's named after Caesar. Do you think there's a statue in that town about Julius Caesar? Yes. Julius Caesar, famous general. And what was his mantra? I came, I saw, I... Okay, so Julius Caesar, right? The man with the sword, the general. He's the leader. He calls people together and they kill the enemy. And so when Peter says, you are the Messiah, he's thinking Caesar. He's thinking, get the sword, Jesus, and let's conquer. We're ready. We're going to go. You got the backing of the people. You're surging in the polls. Everyone's going to come and follow you. Be brave heart. Call to unite the clans. We're ready. But Jesus isn't going to be that kind of leader. Jesus is not going to be that kind of Messiah. Jesus isn't interested in being good to great. Jesus is going to do something very different. Listen to verse 31. Then Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo suffering and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. After three days, rise again. Jesus saw all this quite openly. And Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you're setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Now, that word rebuke is such a great word in, in, in the Greek. It's so good. Because when Jesus went to a storm, it says he rebuked the storm. He basically said, be silent or like, shut up, storm. And it shut up. And so think of this scene. Suddenly, Jesus is saying, no, the Messiah is going to die. And Peter's like, rebukes Jesus. He's literally saying, shut up, Jesus. To which Jesus turns back and says, no, you shut up, Peter. I love this, like, going back and forth. Satan, get behind me. Like, that's not the typical Jesus you expect, telling his disciple to shut up, but I'll stop. I'll shut up now on that point. So what's going on? Well, Jesus is saying, Peter, I'm not going to be that Messiah you think. I'm going to be the one who has to die. I must die. For Peter, he just doesn't get it. He doesn't understand. And for us, we've had 2,000 years to think about it. We know our atonement theories. We know that Jesus must die. Why? It's objective atonement. Jesus must die to appease God's justice. Or subjective atonement. Jesus must die to show us how to live. Or the ransom theory. Jesus must die to defeat the devil and to free us from eternal death. Or Jesus must die to show us God's love. Like We have all these theories. We, we can talk about this. But for Peter, he didn't have any of that. He heard that the Messiah must die, and he couldn't make sense of that because the Messiah is like Julius Caesar. And Jesus is saying, no, that's not who I am. 
I'm going to have to die. Jesus saying, Peter, I'm going to be like Tony Stark in the end game. There's only one outcome that, that wins it for everyone. It's, it's, it's Tony Stark's death. Alex, do you like that reference? Okay. But Peter couldn't make sense of that. He didn't make sense in that moment. And I wonder if that's not where many of us find ourselves in. In the moment in which we're living, this pandemic has caused us to see the world and we think it just doesn't make sense. I mean, how can God be in charge when there's so much pain? And how can I follow Jesus when the church doesn't look like the way it's supposed to look? It's not right. The America of today is not the America that I want it to be. It's not conservative enough, or it's not liberal enough, or it's, it's not conquering enough, or it's not gentle enough, or it's exploitive enough, right? We have all these ideas of what the church is supposed to be or what the world's supposed to be, and we have these ideas, and what the reality is, we just don't see how God is working. And we get stuck like Peter. And we're telling God, whether out loud or not, we're rebuking God and saying, just stop it. To which God says, I'm not going to be the God you want me to be. I'm going to be the God that you need. That's what he's saying to Peter. But then it goes a little further still. In verse 34, he goes on to say this. Jesus called the crowd and his disciples, including Peter, and said to them, If any of you want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up the cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for, for the sake of the gospel will save it. Now what Jesus does here is so great. He doesn't give Peter all the answers. He doesn't say, this is why I have to die. Instead, he just says, Peter, follow me. I'll get you home. Follow me. I got this. Follow me. I'll take care of you. Now, Peter is like all of us Americans. We don't really like to follow. That's not in our DNA. We like to lead. We like to be in front. I mean, when was the last time at a commencement for a college commencement that the speaker congratulated the graduates and said, I congratulate you on becoming the followers of tomorrow. Have you ever seen a reward, someone given a community follower award? No one puts on their resume, I have strong followership abilities. <laughs> right? And how many parents would be really happy if someone came to you and said, you know what, I just want to tell you, your son is such a great follower. Right? We don't, we're like, what? No, we got to lead. We got to be like Caesar, champion. And yet Jesus say, no. Follow me. Because what Jesus is doing is he wants you to join him in the absolute foolishness of the gospel. He's calling you to be countercultural. He's calling us to lead with love. He's calling us to turn the other cheek. He's calling us to use our resources to bless others. He's calling us to join him on the bus with all the other misfits. And he wants you on there and he says, I'm going to keep you on that bus. And you know what? It's about time we start doing that. Because if we're honest with ourselves, for the last two years, the last five years, the last 20 years, or our whole lives, we have been set on following Caesar. We have said, if we stack the courts right, then we're going to get the outcome we want. Or if we have the president in the right president, then everything's going to be right. Or if we have the right business in place, then we're all going to be okay. And if our military has the right weapons, then we're going to be okay. And what has that led us? Has it united us? Has it made us more loving? Has it brought us together? Has it made us more peaceful? Has it blessed the world? No, 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 it never will. Jesus is saying, stop following Caesar. 
It will kill you and kill those around you. Instead, he says, follow me and love. Because if you can love the way that I love, that alone will actually give you life. Life that begins now and extends to your neighbors and goes forever. Caesar came to conquer. Jesus came to give life. Caesar calls his followers to take up the sword. Jesus calls his followers to take up the truth. Caesar consolidates power by subjugating others. Jesus gives his power away and sets us free. Caesar came to kill. Jesus came that we might live and live abundantly. That's the kind of Messiah that we have. And that's the Messiah who says, come and follow. Follow in the way of the cross. Follow with all of your heart. Because why did the Son of Man must die? Because he had to love. And love, he's willing to die so that we would live forever. And so let us love as we've been loved. In Jesus' name, amen.